So, uh, Jack, what did you think? Did you hear uh, Alan's talk? Yes, I did. Do you have any questions or comments about that? Um, I, I guess the, the one thing that I was surprised by is the number of cases that uh, they've done an exit procedure with, uh, with a lobectomy at the time of exit procedure. Because we've not had a case where we thought that was necessary. Well, everyone realizes you don't have much volume in Toronto, Jack, so <laughs> I'm not sure that's legitimate. But, uh, you know, certainly uh, you could argue that we have overused the exit with uh, CCAMs. There's no question that some of them definitely required it and benefited from it. You can also uh, say that in some cases you can squeak kids through with some risk of mishap uh, by not doing an exit procedure. Um, but as I said, I think we've gotten more selective as time has gone by, and we really reserve it for, you know, the average CVR on them has been over two, which is, those are big lesions, and we reserve it particularly for cases where there's evidence of compression. So you have diaphragmatic eversion, marked mediastinal shift, often ascites and other uh, issues. Sometimes the kids are a little premature. So for a variety of reasons, you want a nice controlled, um, you know, resection without the need for any kind of emergent ventilation and potential for hypoxemia. So um, you can argue that we overuse it. I, I think for the most part it's been, we do get very severe cases at CHOP, and I think it's been justified. When do you do the ECMO? Is that during the exit procedure, or are those four patients uh, no, we, required ECMO during the We stay? haven't used exit to ECMO. We always give them a test of uh, conventional ventilation because it's very rare to need ECMO in uh, CCAM patients, um, very rare. <laughs> JM? Uh, Jack, I was going to say, you have to remember they're in the States and everything is bigger, including the CCAM. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I can imagine what it's like in Texas. <laughs> That's no, right. I, I think what, what Alan says is true when you look at the number of patients that required ECMO, I mean, uh, I think they're getting referred complex cases from all over, and all the simple cases are staying where they are. So uh, their view, their percentage of exit and percentage of fetal surgery, I think is skewed. It does not represent the true uh, natural history of these congenital lung lesions. Alan, we have a question from, uh, did, did you want to respond to, to Jean-Martin? Okay. No, I, I agree yeah. with him, basically. Okay. Um, we have a question from uh, Ravindra Ramadwar. Uh, he says, what is the incidence of subsequent conception after fetal surgery? That's been studied about uh, four times now and, and published. And uh, basically, uh, there's no clear reduction in the ability to have subsequent pregnancy after fetal surgery. The difference is you're not allowed to labor after you have the incision that's performed with fetal surgery. So it's equivalent to a classical cesarean section in the upper part of the uterus and those patients should never uh, labor with future pregnancies. But we've had very little uh, in the way of any long-term uh, maternal morbidity aside from the requirement for cesarean uh, delivery. Uh, and uh, overall, we've had uh, none of the really feared complications like uh, placental accreta uh, at the hysterotomy site. Uh, those kinds of things that you might anticipate occurring haven't been uh, observed thus far, fortunately. Any questions from you, Steve, yeah. at all? Or John, John, do you mean? Well, I, yeah. my question was about the exit procedure. You know, at Akron Children's, we're certainly nowhere near the level you are at CHOP, and we've never done an exit procedure. What would be your thoughts on uh, a, fr a, a pediatric hospital that's busy starting up a, a program like the exit procedure? What, what do you have any, any discussion? Well, yeah, I mean, the exit procedure, uh, is different, and it, it's not a cesarean section. It requires an anesthetic team that's very tuned into the issues required for uterine relaxation and the maternal issues. It requires uh, uh, expertise with the hysterotomy, and uh, so it's a whole team of people that do it. It's certainly something that I think uh, a, a qualified team can learn and be trained in, uh, come observe a few or whatever. Um, uh, without having to have a fetal surgery program. So I think it's something that uh, can be more widely disseminated than fetal surgery can. Uh, but it's a very valuable uh, part of, you know, 
what we do as pediatric surgeons. We do a lot of cervical teratomas, uh, airway uh, obstructive problems. So we've done uh, close to 100 exits now at CHOP in the past 10 years or so, and that's, um, you know, again, we have an unusual referral volume, but I think uh, most hospitals experience kids from time to time that would benefit from an exit, most large children's hospitals. Right. So. I think the key is, I mean, we perform exit procedures, but the key is that you have to have the maternal expertise mm -hmm. at your hospital. And so I think to bring a, a mother into a freestanding children's hospital that doesn't have the maternal expertise is right. probably a bad idea because you have, to, you have to protect, first and foremost, you have to protect the mother. And so... Yeah, that's absolutely right. So uh, I, I think in most places you would need a children's hospital in association with a maternal center. A uh, few places have them together. Um, but if you have the, you know, if you have all of the components to do an exit, there's no reason why you can't learn to do an exit procedure. How many places in the U.S. or around the world perform exit procedures? Is it? I really, I don't know the answer to that because some people call us <laughs> a glorified cesarean and exit procedure. Um, I don't know how many do it right. There are probably four or five in the U.S. that, okay. you know, clearly have the qualifications and uh, the background to do good exit procedures. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the uh, limitation is is having a freestanding children's hospital uh, is, you know, without the maternal fetal delivery. Well, again, if you have, if you have, you know, for many years at job before we, we developed a in-house fetal center, uh, we went over to University of Pennsylvania or we brought the mothers back and forth uh, to do the fetal surgery. So. Uh, if you have a, an adjacent connected right. uh, obstetric center, then uh, it can be done. Yeah, but it's. It, I mean, it, you shouldn't underestimate. It's. I mean, yeah, so. Alan's so good at it that, and their center's so good. But I mean, it's a. We did one a few weeks ago, and it's a huge undertaking. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is weeks and weeks of planning that go in, discussions of the entire team. There's, you know, in our center, there's 15 to 20 people who are involved. Mm -hmm. It's adjacent, you know, there's all sorts of things that go on, and so I think it's not something to undertake yeah. lightly, but it, it can be done very well and very safely. And I, I think if you do one a year, it's probably not enough to justify doing exit procedures. Yeah. If you have the potential to do three to five a year or something, then it's probably something that is uh, a reasonable thing to think about. Um, Alan, we have a question uh, from Sweden. Uh, Dr. Uh, Naji says, he wants to know your opinion about conservative management if the fetus or newborn is asymptomatic. Well, we're, gonna, we're going to get to that uh, in my next talk, which is on postnatal management. I'm sure there'll be a lot more discussion about that than uh, just about any other topic. So yeah. um, why don't we reserve yeah. that, that answer for the next uh, presentation. Perfect. Alan, I have a question. Yeah, Jeff. Yeah. Um, we see uh, kids occasionally with uh, either a, a sequestration or a hybrid lesion that has a large feeding vessel. And those kids will sometimes develop free hydrops or hydrops. What's your thinking about uh, the approach to those? Is there any uh, role for trying to ablate that vessel? That's part of well, I, th I think you have to ask what the mechanism of the hydrops is, uh, Jack. I've seen very few, if any, where I thought it was an a, a high output failure form of hydrops. It's very rare. Most of those uh, BPSs that cause hydrops usually have associated pleural effusions, mediastinal shift, and hydrops on that basis, or their mass effect is enough to result in hydrops. So I think, you know, if you did have one, which again, I haven't seen, that was a high output physiology uh, based on their systemic feeding vessel and, and shunt, um, then it might make sense to. Uh, I think do a fetal operation to uh, correct it. I think some people have advocated doing uh, embolization or sclerotherapy procedures. And uh, I guess if you don't have the capability to do fetal intervention, fetal surgery, you might consider that. But it really is something that, you know, injecting uh, alcohol, for instance, into fetal vessels or even embolic substances into fetal vessels. Um, is something that I think has uh, quite a bit of potential hazard um, and hasn't really been adequately studied. You know, things like neurologic effects of using alcohol as, as a sclerosin in the fetus, I think, are, are very um, 
worrisome. And so I personally, I'm not a big advocate of the lesser, less invasive approaches. Um, I don't think they're indicated very frequently to begin with, and I think if you have one of those lesions, it would probably be better served by um, if you're capable an open approach or referral to a center that does open surgery. Your your video that stopped short, um, there's some questions about that. Uh, the Talk to us about how it is different doing a lobectomy in a fetus of 23 weeks. Is it is it the same as, uh, what are the, some of the technical challenges, some of the differences in findings? Well, I think um, the basic operation is the same. What's different, different is the consistency of the tissues and the size. And the size, I don't think, is a major limitation. As, as pediatric surgeons, we operate on neonates, premature infants, 28-weekers, et cetera. And so the, the size difference isn't uh, really the limitation. What the limitation is is the delicacy of the tissues. And as you get down to 23 weeks, if you get down to 20 weeks, like we currently do with myelomeningocele, it actually begins to get very gelatinous and friable. And so um, you really have to be very careful. And the mishaps we've had have usually been related to traction, to things like that, where you tear tissues that uh, you wouldn't normally tear with open surgery. We use uh, most of the same instruments, although we use things like Q-tips and stuff like that that are a little more delicate for some of the fetal stuff. But um, overall, it's not, uh, I don't think, that much different than doing an operation on a premature infant until you get down to the, the point where the tissues are, are really becoming uh, gelatinous and have poor integrity. Okay, so just like a minor point. So we spend all this time positioning the babies for our open surgery or thor thoracoscopic surgery. How do you position, is it moving around? How do you stabilize the fetus? <laughs> well, the, the fetus is anesthetized. So you have anesthesia no, I mean, from the mother yeah. and you have a, an anesthetic and paralytic shot that you give the fetus in addition so the fetus isn't moving around. Okay. You position the fetus before you open the uterus, so you've got an amniotic fluid space and you convert the fetus to the position that you want to, him to be in or her okay. to be in. And so if you're operating on the chest, you really want to get the arm on that side out of the hysterotomy to expose the chest adequately for a thoracotomy, right? And then you stabilize them with the arm, and they're sort of like a cork in the fluid with the hysterotomy, right? So you're infusing amniotic fluid, the fetus will come up and almost seal the hysterotomy. Um, and it'll be buoyed by the uh, mm. amniotic infusion underneath it. So, it's, so cool. it's fairly stable. It's not, <laughs> you know, the fetus doesn't move around. It doesn't, because really you, do you, you, uh, you don't put like uh, something on either side of them to keep nope. it? Wow, well, okay. It stays fairly stable. Once you control the arm for a thoracotomy, mm -hmm. it's, right. you pretty much have them. Okay. You have them where you want them. But have you had to do any, uh, Dr. Flake, any pneumonectomies on the fetuses? And what are the, what are the long-term issues with that? Yeah, we've, we've never um, done a complete <coughs> pneumonectomy successfully. We did have a case, I'll talk about a little uh, later, uh, bronchial, uh, mainstem bronchial atresia that uh, we tried to do a pneumonectomy on and that uh, infant didn't survive the fetal procedure. So we have not had a successful pneumonectomy um, thus far. But we've done bilobar, bilobectomies, we've done uh, sections where you leave a very small piece of, because a lot of these kids will have abnormal fissure formation, and so it's very hard to sometimes uh, separate them in an anatomic fashion. And we've had a number of kids where we've let, and, and the residual lung tissue has been compressed and is very small to begin with. So we've had a number of kids where we've left a very small fragment of lung in one uh, plural space, and that grows dramatically. Um, it's amazing how, how much a small piece yeah. of lung tissue will grow as long as you preserve its hmm. 